Hi guys and welcome to this week's video. It's a tutorial or a guide as such on how to print at home or at least prepare your images ready for print. I'll offer you loads of advice and plenty of tips as well in this guide. So no matter where you are within your photography journey, when it comes to printing at least, I can guarantee you there is something in this tutorial for everybody. The printer I use is a Canon Pro 300. It's an A3 Plus printer and I've got to tell you right off the bat, it's as good as any lab, if not better. It produces images better than any printer I've owned previously. It's fantastic. But as a declaration, I'm a, an out and out Canon fanboy. If you've followed me over the years on my YouTube channel, you'll know that I only shoot using Canon gear. So much so that I've used their gear since the 1980s. Got no intention of changing that either. It's just one of those things. If it's something that you like, something that serves you well, then you serve it well back in return. It's that simple. Papers, again, unashamedly, Guess what? I'm a Canon fanboy. I use all sorts of their papers, including the fine art range of Canon papers as well. Pro Platinum, fine art smooth. And this is incredible paper. Premium fine art rough. I'll be printed with this by the way today. So they're just to name a few, but unashamedly, I am a Canon out and out fanboy. There are other papers on the market, of course, but that's entirely up to you. I just like to keep everything as straightforward and hassle and fuss free as I possibly can. The screens that I use are Dell screens and I have three of them all identical in the studio and they are brilliant. They're probably seven or eight year old now, maybe even slightly older, but I still use them because of their functionality and they're just great. I wouldn't want to change them for anything else and I can guarantee you you can probably buy a mint one of these on eBay for less than a price of a brand new calibration kit. Now I don't want to go down that rabbit hole again and talk too much about calibrating screens but my advice to you would be I've got to advise you on this use a good screen and make sure it's calibrated but on the other side of that Calibrating the screen isn't that important if you've got a good screen like mine with color grading in it. If you're new to photography and you're using a really poor screen, then no amount of calibration in the world is going to fix that anyway. Let me just get that right out there. On the other hand, if you're a high-end photographer and you print lots of work for galleries, then of course, use a high-end screen and make sure it's calibrated to within an inch of its life. But I've been doing this job now for nearly 20 years and I have never ever calibrated any monitor I have ever owned. But if you do want to hear my extended philosophy on calibrating screens, then check my other video out again. But I don't want to cover it in this, I've already covered it once and I want to crack on with this guide. So far, we've talked about the printer and papers that I use and the screens that I use here in the studio as well. But there's one other element that's equally as important and that is the papers that you choose to print on. So your papers of choice. Now I'm gonna use this word your quite a bit because what I need you to do is to ignore all of the advice that you've been given with regards to what looks good on what. In my opinion, it's all about experimentation. Now, of course I can give you some guides, and the guides are thus. If you photograph bright, vibrant, colorful images, then the recommendation or the guide or the uh, information that we like to offer out is to print them on glossy paper because the gloss will really make the colors pop and as you can see i'm not sure if you can see it but it really does work gloss and color is fantastic but so is 
semi-gloss. This is uh, a satin finish with color. And as you can see there, all the colors are popping equally as good. Or in my opinion, in this particular wedding picture, I'm not sure if you can see that there, but in this particular wedding picture, the semi-gloss, that satin feel gives it a much more professional look. So as you can see, brightly vibrant color pictures look fantastic on glossy paper, but also look great on semi-gloss satin paper as well. Black and whites on the other hand, and this is definitely advice that I would offer, black and whites look fantastic on semi-gloss paper, on satin paper. They just look brilliant. Also satin and matte paper can hide lots of ailments. So if you take an image that's very noisy, for instance, then especially matte paper will hide a lot of ailments. So already we're topsy-turvy, and this is only a guide. For instance, this is a classic a real classy looking wedding picture that I took of a bride and bridesmaids in a window printed on semi-gloss or satin paper and it looks really classy, really classy. But having said all of that, this on the other hand is a black and white image printed on glossy paper. So that's in theory going against the advice that I and probably most photographers will offer you. But look, Let's get these out of the way. Experiment with the black and whites on shiny, non-shiny paper, the colors on shiny, non-shiny papers. Experiment with all the myriad of fine art papers that's out there as well. Some you will like the results of, some you won't. But that's the same as photography anyway. You'll turn up at a location, sometimes you like the shift that you put in and the results pay dividends, or sometimes you come away feeling a little bit disappointed. So at the end of the day, just experiment. And a very important bit of advice as well, advice that's generally overlooked. Give consideration to how your images will look as a collective. For instance, if you want your images to look very professional and hung on your office wall, then give consideration to how all of your images will look from a distance as a collective. Uniformity is key here. There's nothing worse than seeing a color image on shiny paper next to a black and white image on matte paper, next to a black and white image on shiny paper, next to a color image on matte paper, and especially if all the sizes vary. Just think about, if you were to go and view a photographer's work at a gallery, I can almost guarantee you that the images will look very uniformed from a distance. So they're likely to be the same size, they're likely to be on the same paper, and they're likely to be finished in the same way, i.e. all of the images will be on satin paper. I can almost guarantee that. It's very important how your images look as a collective. That's a good bit of advice that's very often overlooked. Right, enough of the ramblings. Let's throw ourselves into Photoshop and crack on with this tutorial. When I say Photoshop, I use Photoshop, but if you use another software, then all of the advice and tips that I offer you can still be used in exactly the same way. For this tutorial, I'm gonna choose this image here. It's nice, bright, vibrant, and colorful. So let's first of all throw this into Photoshop. The image is now opened up in ACR, which is Adobe Camera Raw, which is the pre-Photoshop screen, but you can do this in Lightroom as well. Now, if you've ever printed in the past and you've been unhappy with your prints, I can almost guarantee you this. The chances are the prints coming off your printer will be slightly darker than the image that you're seeing on the screen. Now, the best will in the world, no matter what you do in terms of calibrating your screen or calibrating your printer or the ICC profiles that we're going to use, we'll come on to that in a second if you don't know what I'm talking about, I can almost guarantee you this, the images that come off your printer will never ever look identical in terms of brightness to the image on your screen. For the one simple reason, the image on the screen is backlit and the picture that you're looking at from your printer is being viewed from light that's reflected. They will never be the same. Now to give yourself a fighting chance to make your print look 
as close or as near as damn it as the image on your screen, I would suggest that you do this as a first. Take your image into whatever software that you're using and just lift the exposure by about a quarter to a half a stop. We'll do that now in a second so you can see what that looks like. But more often than not, even with calibration, our screens tend to be turned up too bright. We, we're like that as human beings. We like vibrant, bright things. So if you get your mobile phone, for instance, the first thing you do is turn the brightness of your screen up. It's exactly the same as the brightness on our monitors. In actual fact, that's probably one of the things that your calibration would probably cure, and that is to turn the brightness of your monitor down. So there's a good tip for you. Turn your monitor brightness down a little bit if the images that you're producing on your prints are too dark right so let's give this a go this is my image i'm just going to simply grab my exposure and turn my exposure up let's say for argument's sake half a stop nothing's overexposed everything looks bright and vibrant now depending on the paper that you're going to print this on i.e if you're going to print this on matte paper where the colors will be slightly muted then you might want to exaggerate that by pushing the shadows ever so slightly and making the image less contrasty all I'm going to do now is open that image up into Photoshop. I will give you one tip, and that is a tip on how I go about sharpening my landscape images while we're here. First of all, if we press Ctrl and J, Command and J on the Mac to create a new layer. Next, go to Filter, Other, then High Pass, and click on OK. Now, what I recommend that you do is adjust this radius until these edges just pop through just pop through i'm going to make it slightly overboard here just so you can see exactly what i'm doing let's make that five like so and then hit enter and your image should look like that now to remove the grayness in the image change the layer properties to overlay and then all the gray will disappear and if you switch it on and off you can see there's a massive difference when it comes to sharpening this image has already been sharpened so the image looks over sharp at the moment but look let me offer you this tip don't overwork or over sharpen your images if they look bad on there they will certainly look bad as a print Next, we're going to assign an ICC profile to this image. Now, this isn't a life or death situation. I'll explain how ICC profiles work, but if you can use one, I definitely would recommend that you do. ICC profiles are important, but sometimes not necessary. If I explain what an ICC profile is, then it's up to you whether you choose to use one or not. An ICC profile is a small bit of software that's just readily available from wherever you get your papers from. In my instance, because I only use Canon papers, then the ICC profiles are available from the Canon website. An ICC profile will just inform Photoshop a, what printer you're using, and B, what printer paper you're using. And then Photoshop, in its infinite wisdom, will try and give you a visual representation of what your image is likely to print out like. If you've never used an ICC profile before, then they're very easy to use, but in a lot of cases, they're really not necessary. Let me show you the process anyway, then you can make your own mind up. Click edit, come down to convert to profile, convert to profile and click on OK. Then you're met with a pop-up box. Now on the profile here, assuming you've already downloaded your ICC profile, we're going to click on that. And as you can see, and now I have a whole pile of options in front of me. Like I said, experimentation is key and that's what I'm gonna be doing with this picture. So I'm going to come down and choose Premium Fine Art Rough. Now the engine, make sure the engine again is on Adobe ACE. And I'm going to choose Perceptual. Perceptual is the default setting usually. But if I was to choose something like Relative Colorimetric, click on that. Now you can see, if you look at the image, you'll see that the colors change ever so slightly. Certainly the contrast changes ever so slightly. So based on your settings, Photoshop is trying to give you a visual representation of what your image will look like. 
Let's click on perceptual and again, I usually have the black point compensation ticked, but as you can see in this particular image, checking that box on and off doesn't make any difference whatsoever. But I can almost guarantee you if you click on this relative colorimetric sign, then yeah, there you go. Clicking that on and off, you'll see now makes a massive difference to how your image will look. So let's go back to perceptual and leave that clicked on and click on OK. Now, as you can tell from this image, there isn't much of a difference at all when we assign that ICC profile. If there was a difference, if the image, for instance, looked a bit wishy-washy, now you can correct that wishy-washy look or just accept the fact that that's how the image is going to be printed. So that's our image ready for print. Next, let's set up our page and make sure that all our sizings are correct. And I do it this way. First of all, what I suggest you do is visit the paper that you're going to print and look at the size. This is A3+, plus, so it's a fairly common size, but the centimeters are 33 by 48. Setting a page up to make sure your sizings are correct in Photoshop is so simple to do. First of all, press Ctrl and N to create a new document. You could change the name on there if you wish. We know it's in centimeters and we know it's 33 by 48. But the width is longer than the height, so let's make sure that's 48 width by 33 in height. Ensure that your resolution is 300 dpi. Next, come down to your color profile again and let's assign the premium fine art rough profile and leave everything as is. That's everything as it should be and we're going to click on OK. So what I'm now looking at, I'm looking at a document the exact same size as the paper that I'm going to print on. That means now when I drag this image onto my paper, I can set up the image exactly how I want it to be printed. Now the image, as you can see, is slightly larger than the paper, but because we do it this way, I know exactly how the image is going to print. So I can choose to move this image in or around and recrop it. But what I'm going to do in this instance, I'm going to add a white border. Just move that round so it's perfect in the center and that looks good. It's up to you whether you choose to use a white border or not. Even though we've got our image set up ready to go in Photoshop, it's good to know your equipment as well. Now this printer prints edge to edge at A3+, but it doesn't print edge to edge at A3+, on certain fine art paper. And I know for a fact that the rough paper that I'm using, this printer doesn't print A3+. So I'm going to create a border. But a good thing about setting the image up like this, it means that I can see exactly how the image is going to be printed. Once that's in place, just hit enter and away we go. Right, so what I see is what I get. Next, let's go to layer and flatten that layer. And that is exactly how the print will come out. To send the image to print, press Ctrl and P to bring up your printer options. Right, let's go through these printing properties. First of all, photo printing, make sure that is selected. I need to untick the borderless printing box. Next is the media type. Let's come down and let's find our paper, fine art papers, premium fine art rough. Let's click on that. So because we've opted for that particular paper, this printer is saying we cannot feed the paper in through the top. We've got to feed the paper in from the back. Not really a problem, not a problem at all. Next is select the printer paper size, which is A3 plus 33 by 48 centimeters. Print quality. Now, I would always recommend that you click the highest. Now, this particular fine art paper will offer a little bit of a wishy-washy look anyway. And if you want to save a little bit of ink, then standard in this particular instance will do. But I would genuinely recommend that you use the highest setting. So let's just click on highest. 
everything is there ready and raring to go. Just click on main just to double check everything. Print quality, highest, color intensity, everything's exactly the same, exactly as it should be. And then we're going to click on OK. Remember, we've set everything up in Photoshop, including adding an ICC profile. So let's keep it that way. We don't want the printer now to take over. So leave it that Photoshop manages colors. Print a profile paper. Again, premium fine art, make sure that is selected. Normal printing. And we opted for perceptual and the black point. They're by default anyway, so just leave them. And then we're ready and raring to go. Click on print. So again, it's just a visual check just to make sure that nothing's cropped and you haven't messed up in your settings. It really is straightforward. If this is the very first time you've ever printed, this seems a laborious task, but especially if you're going to recreate the same prints on the same paper, then honestly, it's a case of just adding paper and then printing, adding paper and then printing. It really is that simple. with that remember I said experimentation is key I am super excited I've never printed such a a bright and vibrant image on such a uh, a matte paper that generally mutes the colors and pastelizes them but that is exquisite and I'm not saying that lightly so I'm very excited about that print here endeth this guide here endeth this tutorial I'll leave all the links to all of the equipment that I've used down below. If you want to go and check them out for yourself, especially this printer, couldn't recommend it anymore if I tried. So that's it. Thank you very much indeed for watching. Do me a favor, help support the channel, give it a thumbs up. And if you're new here and you want to find your way back, I do have one or two half decent videos, even though I say so myself. And to do that, you might find it easier if you subscribe to the channel. Till the next time, guys. Cheers.